All right. We've got a live stream going. We usually have a few minutes where people appear, so I will do things like say hello to the recording. Welcome to the Squirrel Squadron. Lots of you are watching on a recording later than today because you had something else to do, which is fantastic. So um, there's a, a huge library. I think we have a year and a half, maybe two years worth of recordings now. Laura, when she joins us, my community manager can remind us that the Squirrel Squadron, of course, is my free community. Um, it's my way of giving back. I've got tech and non-tech people together. I think it's the only community I know of that works like that where uh, we have discussions on the forum, uh, where we have um, uh, interesting and uh, I hope um, uh, compelling events and provocative events like, like this one, where I talk about uh, challenging topics. You ask me lots of questions. Um, those are always great learning for me and, and uh, people tell me they're valuable to them as well. So uh, today's event is about uh, finding the big boss and uh, we're gonna talk all about what you can do to get in touch with whoever it is who has those purse strings in their tight little grip. So uh, hang on for that as people are joining. Uh, I'm just gonna remind everyone that this works a lot better if you ask me questions. So if you, nobody has any questions, I got some topics I'd like to, to uh, rap about a little bit and I will do that. Uh, and we'll probably finish early and I can go walk the dog, which is always okay with me. But you'll get more if you ask me some questions. The other thing is Laura can't join us right at the beginning. So I hope this is all working. It looks like it is. I see names of people. I, I think that it's happening. Um, but do me a favor, particularly because we're without Laura to start. Would you stick something in the chat to say, hi, I'm here. Uh, but even better, I'd sure like to know what brought you here. What made you interested in this particular topic? Are you a big boss and you want people to find you? Are you uh, someone who is frustrated that you can't get budget for something? How do you get in touch with that person who has the purse strings? Uh, those are all the kinds of topics we'll talk about here. So Peter says it's working. Hallelujah. That's great. Um, so very glad that that's happening. Let me just review a couple things that um, have happened or are coming up. Uh, we've got discussions on the forum about the Vision Pro. I really think there's a lot happening in augmented reality of all crazy things to be looking at. Um, it's not just for games. Um, uh, we have a discussion with someone from South Africa on this topic. Uh, I don't know if I think it was Richard. Uh, I don't know if he's here, but he was saying he was a big boss and um, he sometimes couldn't find the bigger boss. So that sounded really interesting. Uh, and then I was talking about influencers. Uh, I'm always very interested in influence. How do you influence that big boss? Uh, and uh, it turns out you can have a job as an influencer. Who knew? Certainly when I was a kid, that didn't exist. So talking about how influencers work, how you gain influence and how you get to the right person. We got loads of uh, good events coming up. For example, we have um, how to hire uh, star engineers. How do you get that 10X person into your organization if you aren't a coder yourself? Uh, we have another one on painless culture change. How do we change things around so our organization works differently, has a different culture, has a different mindset? Uh, I do a lot of that all day, every day. So I'd uh, love to talk to you about that topic. Uh, and then we have one on software architecture. So don't run away. If that sounds scary, this is architecture for dummies. How do you understand how software is put together, whether it'll scale, whether it's going to be suitable for you uh, uh, without necessarily having to have a technical background? So events like that coming up, um, all of them free. This is just my way of giving back the Squirrel Squadron. So um, uh, feel free to come along to any of those. You find out about those on squirrelsquadron.com. That's where you can get lots more information. OK, so I'm going to change gears here, and I'm going to say um, a few things about um, this today. This topic today. Uh, uh, what is a big boss? Where do you find them? What do you do with them once you find them? That's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, now, I have to give a disclaimer, which is I have never worked in a gigantic organization as an employee. I've been a consultant or a contractor to very large organizations, which have big bosses. And what is it? The the, the fleas have little fleas to eat them. And uh, there's an old poem about this. There's some um, uh, lines I can't remember. But the point is that uh, uh, I've never actually worked myself in an organization that large. That's my disclaimer. Uh, I have been uh, involved with many organizations that are large enough to have this kind of big boss person somewhere out there in the mists, and you, you don't quite know who they are or where they, you know, what castle they live in. Uh, that's a familiar experience to me, but not one I've done directly. I haven't been the employee. However, I have very frequently been involved in finding the right person to make a sales decision about me or my company at various points in my life when I was helping to sell or, or selling my own services as I do now. 
And in those circumstances, I'm definitely as part of the sales process, trying to find the big person who can move money, who can shift the company's organization to uh, take up a new product, to try a new approach. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of that. And um, there are plenty of examples where um, uh, I've had to help somebody to navigate this kind of circumstance where I'm coaching someone or I'm helping a team or I'm uh, looking for a change in an organization that I'm working with. And so I've seen this puzzle happen over and over and over again. So I want to point out some of the patterns that I've seen uh, as I've worked with those different, uh, different organizations. So I'll tell you a funny story first. I always like to start with something funny. Uh, Roland says he's interested in this because of the time of year. I'm guessing that you might need to get some money out of somebody. So uh, at the end of the year is a good time to do that. Uh, always nice to see you here, Roland, and, and glad it's all working over on LinkedIn. Um, so uh, uh, funny story goes back to one of those organizations, one of the very first ones that I worked with um, at that time as a uh, well, I guess our company was a consultant, but I was a lowly contractor. I was just an ordinary person working on the, the front line, uh, the coal face, building the software that was going to help, in this case, with water billing. Uh, I got to know more about how farmers use water and how they share uh, pipes and everything else than you would ever want to know. Uh, and so at one point, I was just working away at my desk, one, uh, and, and somebody popped up with a little note. And the little note said, uh, phone back Bill Jones or something like that. I don't remember the person's name anymore. Um, and um, this was quite shocking. I didn't know who Bill Jones was, but other people started gathering around my desk and Bill Jones, Bill Jones wants to talk, Bill Jones wants to talk to Squirrel? Why on earth is this, what is, uh, why is Bill Jones phoning Squirrel? Bill Jones was the either the CEO or chief of staff or something like that at this company with tens of thousands of employees, this giant organization. This guy was at the top or near it. I didn't really know who he was. I was just a minion doing my job. But for some reason, uh, this guy really particularly wanted to talk to me. And I thought maybe it was some specialist knowledge I had. I'd come into the, the, the project via so, some specialist tools that I'd worked with. I uh, thought maybe that was relevant to what the person wanted to talk to me about. I, I tried not to get too big ahead about it. I just said, okay, fine, I'll call this person back. I phoned, got some secretary. We started talking about organizing a meeting. And everybody treated me different after that. They thought, oh, yeah, make sure to tell Bill this, or um, uh, this is an issue that, uh, that Bill's going to be interested in. It suddenly moved me onto a different plane for a little while. Until the next day when I came back in and, and I had another note on my desk, this time from the secretary, and the person said, we're, uh, once I got him on the phone, we're very sorry, Bill doesn't actually want to meet with you. He, he wants to meet with somebody who's leading Project Squirrel. So apparently they had projects that they had named after different things. And uh, it, it was the turn of the squirrels uh, to have be named Project Squirrel. And, and somehow this person had got confused between Project Squirrel and Squirrel the person. I hadn't quite expected there'd be a person named Squirrel wandering around the organization. So I never did meet Bill. Uh, I never did find out what he wanted to talk about with regard to Project Squirrel or Squirrel the person or anything else. So sometimes the big boss will just appear. And you better be ready. And I'm going to say a bit more about how to be ready and how you behave when you actually meet uh, such a person. Uh, I've got a funny story about that. Um, but uh, I wanted to tell you that opening story because you shouldn't discount serendipity. It could be that you just get lucky. And if I played my cards right and, and if I'd cared, uh, I probably could have got to talk to Bill and, and tell him some important piece of information from the front line. So don't discount the fact that someone may just turn up. Much more frequently, however, you've got some great idea. You'd like to do a different process in your technology team, or you'd like to offer a different kind of product, or you'd like to sell to a new organization or a new type of customer. There's something you want to do that's different, and um, uh, it can be difficult to figure out who can actually be interested, who will be who will be interested in and what you might do to move them and others in the direction you want. I'll just mention one. I'm not going to tell a full story because I've never been able to find the story. I'd love it if one of you could help me with this. Um, uh, what I understand, but I don't know much more detail, is that there were two people inside a company called Nokia uh, and uh, up there in Sweden, I think maybe Norway. I can't remember which. I'm sorry. Um, I think it was Sweden. They, they uh, uh, at that time, were a timber company. This is in the 1950s. And they were chopping down Swedish trees, uh, happily um, uh, shoving them into lumber mills and um, uh, making paper and, and two by fours and whatever else you make out of trees. And these two folks in the middle of the organization, they weren't um, just straight out of university, new grads, but they certainly were not directors or anything like that. And from their two different places in the organization, they looked at each other and said, we're running out of trees. There just aren't that many trees left here. We should do something about that. 
And there's something they did. This is the part I which I would love to to fill in. That there was something they did to shift that company completely away from extractive industries like uh, timber into transistors and uh, electronics. And you might have noticed that they did pretty well making phones and so on. They had various difficulties along the way, but they certainly didn't run out of trees or transistors. So that's proof that this is possible, that it is, it, it is, um, and I'll give you a few more examples as we go. It is possible to go find the right person. It's possible to shift an organization from the middle. Um, but uh, I, I want to tell you a bit more about how you do that. So um, uh, please stop me with questions. Uh, Peter and Roland, uh, th thanks for commenting. I appreciate that. Uh, if you have questions, something that brought you here uh, that you'd like me to cover, please do tell me. Uh, so I'd love to hear about puzzles. This will be better if you ask me. If not, I'll just tell you a bunch of stories and I'll have fun. That's a, That'll be perfectly okay too. Um, so one of the cases, one of the possible situations is that uh, the, the person who is the big boss is someone you know, but you can't find them. You know their name, but you're not sure where their office is. Um, you're not sure whether you could get through the many secretaries or, uh, or um, uh, assistants or uh, minions who might be surrounding them. You know, you know it's kind of like a, a boss in a video game. You have to make your way through uh, a, a maze and uh, a number of uh, uh, smaller bosses before you get to the big one. So if that's your situation, uh, then I'd encourage you to do a couple of different things. Um, one is uh, camp out. So this person gets to work somehow, and you may have to go and figure out where that is, where their office is, and there may be some challenge there. Um, I'll talk in a minute about how you, how you get to the right place. But once you, if you have a, a target, if you have a place where they're likely to be, um, actually, I have actually sat outside someone's office for a while um, until they come out. And I say, I have something important to tell you. You have to have a lot of confidence for this. We'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, you have to really believe that you have something valuable to say because you're not going to get very long. And this person probably is thinking about other stuff. But if you really have something that's meaningful to them, you should be able to get their attention. Even if it means you don't get on their calendar, you actually just have to encounter them. Uh, they're unlikely to just phone you up looking for Project Squirrel, but you can engineer that. You can create that situation. And I have literally camped outside someone's office uh, in order to get their attention. Now, how do you figure out um, uh, sort of uh, uh, where they might be, what their office uh, might look like, uh, you know, where, where do they hang out if you know who they are? Um, is uh, typically there'll be some kind of public activity. Somebody is big enough to be working in this way, whether it's a, a, a client, you know, somebody you'd like to, to sell to. Uh, and I've certainly done that where I've, I've tried to catch someone at a trade show or at a speech or something like that and talk to them about something that, that I think would be valuable to them uh, that I might have to sell. Or if it's internal, maybe they're uh, speaking at a company all hands, they're um, uh, discussing a, a topic at a board meeting and the board meeting is public and you know, you're know you not gonna go to the board meeting probably, but uh, you could uh, arrange to be outside. So there's a number of different tricks for um, uh, kind of figuring out where these folks are. I can say more about it if you like. Ah, um, someone, and I, I never get to see the names on LinkedIn sometimes. Some of the, there's something wrong with LinkedIn so it doesn't show me. So I don't know who you are, but you asked, um, uh, showing up is great, but how do you suggest you make sure, how do I suggest you make sure that what you feel is important is important to them. That's exactly what I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. So hang on there. Uh, we're gonna hit that one. Um, but I want to, to bring up um, one other um, uh, sort of technique for finding out what's important to them. Uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, say more about how to kind of find them and, and make sure that that's right. Um, the, with, if they're doing things in public, I remember one case where um, a friend of mine was really frustrated that he couldn't get the minister of something. I, I think it was minister of health. This was pre-pandemic, but it was he was working in the NHS, I think. So the minister of health or something like that um, uh, was um, uh, 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 putting forth policies that made no sense and weren't helping at his level and he could see the effect on uh, on his organization uh and i said well you know you could figure out who he is and what's important to him he, he speaks in parliament um now you may not be dealing with people who are quite uh, uh, quite that public um, but there are uh, pronouncements and annual reports and um, all hands and other sorts of places where you can study the person's um interests, what their initiatives are, what they care about, because if they're doing any kind of good job as a leader, they're not just holed up in a tower somewhere, they're communicating out to the organization. It may be hard to communicate back to them, but you're going to do a lot better if you studied what they have to say. So studying their public pronouncements and um, their ideas is helpful. Uh, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, there's a really good example. I'm going to put this up on the forum after this. So check out the follow-up post. Um, but there's a wonderful video, which I often recommend to um, people that I coach, 
And uh, it's um, a case where Steve Jobs actually communicated with someone well. There are many examples where Steve Jobs did not do that very well, and he's not a great, uh, um, a great example to follow. But here he did, and somebody caught it on video. Uh, it was just after he'd come back to Apple, and he was really shaking up Apple. He was uh, cutting things left and right and focusing the company and so on and uh, saving it from bankruptcy, essentially. Uh, and um, some folks really didn't like that. So he was at some kind of all hands type meeting. They're there in person. Um, he stood on a stage and somebody stands up and really has a go at him for about uh, 90 seconds and uh, you know, tells him where to go and asks him, you know, why did you uh, mess up my team and what have you been doing and uh, is really unfriendly. And Steve really considers that person's feedback, doesn't agree and, and does so very publicly and very clearly. Um, but uh, uh, takes it seriously uh, because uh, he has a message that he wants to give to the group. So that's another great thing to do is help the person give their message, right? So you figure out what they're trying to do. In his case, he was trying to get people to really focus on the customer. What does the customer need? And this person's team was building something that there wasn't so clear who the customer was, at least in Steve's view. And um, uh, so uh, he got a response. He was able to get somewhere. Now, he didn't get the response he wanted. Um, you might do better if you can um, help uh, the person to see that um, working on your idea, your issue, changing the budget, doing the thing you're interested in doing would actually help with the um, the message or the goal or the culture change that they're trying to create. Uh, it, it's um, kind of a judo move uh, or like uh, whittling or something. You want to go with the grain uh, in order to make this work. Okay, so have a look at the Steve Jobs video if you uh, can't find, it should be easy to find um, if you look for Steve Jobs dealing with an insult or something like that, I think you'll find it pretty quickly. And I will put it up on the forum just after this, because um, I think it's so instructive um, for people in, in Steve Jobs's shoes. But then as I was preparing for this, I thought, actually, it's it's informative for how, how not to approach them, but also sort of where to do so. And it, it, you don't have to tweak too much to kind of understand how that person might have gotten uh, maybe not a sympathetic response, but a more informative one. Um, without being quite so negative, going a little more with the grain on what Steve was trying to do. Um, okay, so let me come to the the uh, question here about um, uh, uh, figuring out what's important to them. Um, uh, I'd say one of the most important things for, for figuring out what's important to them, not only studying their public pronouncements, is also one of the tricks for finding someone when you don't know who they are. So the organization may be so big that um, there's just, you know, there's orders coming from somewhere and they, they come through five or six different uh, uh, layers or they're coming from one of your customers and you can't figure out who at the customer is delivering them. There's a, there's a delivery person, but they're clearly not empowered. Um, uh, so there can be different sort of places where you, you don't know who it is. But also in that case, it's particularly difficult, difficult to figure out what's important to them. How are you going to get their attention? And, and so one of the best ways that I know for doing that is to follow the money. Uh, and if you go look up, um, uh, well, it's the, uh, the original book is, um, I can't remember, it's Woodward and Bernstein. It's about um, figuring out the Watergate affair and uh, the deep throat, the person person who was um, get, drip feeding them lots of information said, if you want to figure out who's behind this, uh, follow the money. And that's what they did. They went and figured out who paid for uh, the, the defense of the burglars at the Watergate Hotel, and then they figured out who paid them and so on. And, and eventually they got back to Nixon. Uh, in this case, you're not trying to track down a criminal, so you don't need to worry about that so much. Uh, but uh, what is really interesting is to figure out uh, who is signing the checks. And often, although the finance person who might be paying the invoices or might be refusing to pay your invoices if you're trying to sell to somebody and they're, they're resisting your sale, or um, the, the person who's funding the budget, that they, they, they won't change. Often those finance people aren't necessarily the decision makers. If they are, great, you figured out who it was, and you can start to figure out what they care about because of where they're putting the money. Uh, but also, those finance people are often able to tell you pretty quickly, where, where did this come from? Who's authorizing this budget? How does it get decided? Uh, where do they meet? Um, where is this coming from? And the interesting thing is that um, this follow the money, this um, sort of uh, trail of, of cash um, yeah, is also informative about um, uh, 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 not only what people care about, um, but uh, where the decision making flows. So it can tell you, uh, you know, it's actually two people uh, who are working on this. Um, and uh, there, there's a, um, uh, two, two executives who have come up with this scheme, and uh, we need to work with both of them. That's the kind of information I've often gathered from looking at where the money is going. It, it tells me a lot. 
Um, now, I will mention one other possibility. Sometimes the money trail runs out <laughs> or the trail of where the demands and requests and, and the, the seemingly foolish decisions, um, you, you follow it and you can't find anything. You discover that there just really isn't anything behind it. And, and that's a case I call the mythical, <laughs> the mythical big boss. There, it's not uncommon in, in an organization large enough uh, for there to be a belief that something is true that it just absolutely is not. Uh, customers will never, a famous one, people blame customers or sales. You know, the salespeople will never be able to sell this. And you go find some actual salespeople and they say, I love this. I wish I could have it. Why don't you give it to me? And you say, but the myth is that, that salespeople won't buy it. And you find the head of sales and they say, I've been asking for this for years. Um, so sometimes you just find out it's not true. Um, and I will, I will tell you one story about that. Um, I was at a biotech company and I was helping them to move much faster. I was helping them to deliver the software. Every two weeks, we would change how this, um, it wasn't quite a medical device, but very close, change how it worked. And we figured out how to do that technically, which is itself a big enough challenge when you're dealing with um, uh, genetics and, and uh, patient safety and things. But then everybody said, well, the compliance people will never agree. There's no chance the compliance folks will, will ever go for this because we have to jump through all these regulatory hoops and, and there could be danger to humans. People might cut parts of their bodies off uh, if we get the results of these tests wrong. So I, I didn't have to look very far. I, I just had to figure out where the compliance, in this case, it was a document trail. Where are the compliance people? Who are they? Turned out they were across the room. So they were right over there and I could go walk over and talk to them. And it was mythical. Because when I talked to them about it, they said, my God, you could do things every two weeks. It could be a small set of things we could look at. Look, we get this huge document every six months, and we have no idea what any of it means, and we have to figure it all out. And that's why it takes us so long. If you gave us two pages that describe the three things you changed in two weeks, well, you just can't do that much in two weeks. So uh, we'd love it. It would be super. So uh, it's not uncommon that um, you think there's a big boss, and everyone tells you there's a big boss, and there actually isn't. Um, so... Uh, I hope I'm answering the, the question by all means, um, anonymous person, sorry, I don't know who you are, um, uh, uh, feel free to ask more if needed, but looking at the person's public pronouncements, if they're public, if you know who they are, following the money can be very helpful. Um, and I'm going to give you one more technique in a moment um, that can be very helpful um, when all else fails. So um, if uh, to summarize where we've got to so far, and please ask more questions. I'd love to deal with the things that brought you here and, and the challenges and issues uh, that you're interested in. Um, to summarize so far, we've got uh, the case where you know the person and you can camp out. Um, I've even followed people to their car. I, you have to be careful about this. Maybe be polite and nice and clear that you're not a stalker. But I've, I've said, could I just walk with you for a little while? Um, I see that you're going somewhere. I have an idea. It'll just take 30 seconds. Can I get in the lift with you? Um, so with permission, going with the person somewhere can be helpful because they, they are humans. They, they do walk somewhere. They, they um, are usually willing to listen for a short time while they're doing something else. Um, so that's if you know who the person is and so you can study their, their public uh, pronouncements. Um, and if they're really unknown, uh, one method for finding them is following the money, following the documents, following a trail uh, to see if you can figure out who they are. Um, uh, now, I'll tell you another one which uh, works in pretty much every case, but is higher risk. Uh, but it's one of my favorite ones. Uh, it also involves a fun story. So I'm going to tell you that. Uh, this story sounds like it has nothing to do with our topic today. Don't worry. It's, it's a fun story anyway, but it actually does have a, a, a very important point at the end. Um, so I live, I'm here in my 600 year old house in a, a beautiful, um, tiny, tiny village in uh, England. And uh, this village is so small, we only have eight houses in the village. Um, and we only have one road. And no one knows what the name of this road is. It runs right on the other side of this wall over here. Um, and uh, it just runs along through the village and it comes to an end. It used to go all the way through and it was the road to Canterbury, in fact. The pilgrims would go on it. But these days, uh, it's been stopped up. Um, there's a, a much bigger motorway that's near us, and people use that. And people who come down this road get a little confused, and they turn around in this little turning circle, and they leave. Uh, now, some people come to our village, and um, they stay in the turning circle. And um, you know, some of them are kind of taking a break from work, and they have a little snooze. Uh, some of them decide to smoke something, and it may not be a cigarette. Um, some of them bring someone that they're enamored of, and they hang out down there on a Friday night. We're fine with all of these kinds of uses of this turning circle. It's dark and, and private, and it's helpful to people who want to do those sorts of things. They don't make any trouble for the rest of us here in the village. There's a different type of group of people, and they turn up and they actually camp there. 
and um, uh, they uh, bring a camper van and they bring uh, 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 all kinds of material and, and um, tents and other things. They uh, do um, bonfires and barbecues in the little wooded area that's next to the circle. This is not very comfortable. And sometimes they have fights and the police have to come. This is not very nice for our little village here. We, we would rather these people went and camped somewhere else. Um, and uh, that's not really the, the, the purpose of this area. Uh, to have people camp and live there um, uh, for an extended period. So when this started happening, and we'd phone the police and things, and it took a long time to kind of turn the crank to get this change, um, I started to wonder, well, who's the big boss around here? And by the big boss, I meant who owns this land? Because uh, there's this turning circle on it, there's this wooded area next to it, which these people were using. And so I asked all my neighbors, and they checked their deeds and their maps and their things, and they said, it doesn't belong to me, and it doesn't belong to me. And each one of them said uh, that it didn't seem to be theirs, and, and no one would claim it. And uh, so I uh, did not then just accept this. I didn't say, well, I just have to deal with this um, environment, this um, uh, difficult situation, phone the police periodically. Um, this, this isn't okay. I'm going to do something about it. And so what I did is I hired someone to build a fence. I'd be terrible. You wouldn't want a, a fence I built, but I hired someone who's good at it. And they went and built a fence around this uh, wooded area around the turning circle and uh, put up signs for me that said, uh, private land, no trespassing. Now, let me be clear. I don't own this land. There's no chance that this land belongs to me. It's far, reasonably far from my house. I don't border on it. There's no reason why this land would be mine. Uh, but I put up the fence, the fence and the signs anyway. Now, you might be starting to figure out what I mean by um, uh, having a, uh, a, a method of finding a big boss, because one of the possible outcomes of this, and I'm still waiting to see if this happens, uh, it, one of the possibilities is uh, the landowner turns up and they come pound on my door and they say, hey, Mr. Squirrel, you know, why have you built this fence on my land? You know, I'm not happy about this. What are you doing? It's not your land. Why have you claimed it? And at that point, I will say, hey, I have found you. You are my big boss. You are the owner of this land. Would you like a free fence? And uh, then I will have a conversation with them about what we do when these people turn up and camp on their land. I'm quite happy for it to be their land. Uh, uh, I'm quite happy for them to be responsible for it. I just want them to phone the bailiffs. So that's one way of, uh, of getting to the person who's responsible for whatever it is you're interested in. But uh, there's another possibility, and this seems increasingly likely. No one's turned up yet pounding on my door, this possibility is that no one ever claims it. And that's where the, the, boss, the, boss, the boss is mythical, right? No one has ever really uh, claimed the, this area. Nobody owns it. Um, and uh, in that case, I'm going to go to court in a few years in a process called adverse possession. And I'll prove that I've put up the fence. I've taken care of the land. I've cleared out the underbrush and um, cleared off people who weren't supposed to be there. And um, uh, the court will, uh, I assume, award it to me. And that's squatter's rights. You know, no one claimed it. I went and put my stamp on it, and I took care of it. Okay, now that was a long story. What does that have to do with finding the big boss? I gave you a few hints. What you can do is actually flush out the big boss. You can go and change the development team's process and start doing things differently. Deliver every two weeks. Deliver every day. Uh, you can change your sales approach. You can start going into a new territory or start um, uh, selling to a new type of customer. You could start a new marketing campaign. Wherever you sit in the business, you could start making changes. Now, you're going to have to have a thick skin. Some people around you are going to say, well, that's not okay. You're not supposed to do that. You're going to get in trouble. Your boss, your boss, your individual direct boss may not be happy. You might say, this isn't okay. You should stop doing this. Um, so you have to be brave, and you may be taking quite a risk in doing this. As you know, I might have an unhappy landowner from from my building of a fence, but I guarantee that somebody will turn up pretty quickly, and it will become pretty evident who it is who owns whatever it is that you're trying to change, because uh, they will say, "Hey, what are you doing?" Now that's the point at which, of course, you need to be um, quite assertive and and energetic and um, positive in the way I would be, as I told you, uh, you know, hey, would you like a free fence? Would you like a free marketing campaign? Can I tell you about why we did this? I'm very glad to have found you because it belongs to you. Now I can go and talk to you. So um, uh, I hope that's a, a helpful approach. I wouldn't use that on, on day one. I'd try to find the person uh, initially. But if you're, if you're really having trouble figuring out who's responsible, or if nobody will really claim it, which is a, a common situation even in smaller organizations. It, we seem to always do things this way. We, we've always built software in this kind of slow and clunky way. I was talking to a team earlier today who, who does that and somebody yesterday too. And, and sometimes it's not obvious where that 
process that might be kind of slow and, and difficult and painful, where that came from. Uh, and people just, they do it because they've always done it. So if you start changing it, you'll put somebody's nose out of joint and you'll find out quickly <laughs> who it is. Uh, you talk to them about putting their nose back in joint and, and maybe doing something a little bit different. So I hope that's helpful. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to tell you one more thing about uh, what to do when you find the big boss. What do you do with the big boss once you locate them? Um, but before that, I want to make sure I'm answering any of your questions. I'm going to pause for a moment. If you have questions and topics you wanted to bring up here, I would love to tell you more about those. Um, the person who asked about um, making sure what, what you think is important is important to them. If I didn't answer your question, please tell me. I'd love to hear your feedback. Peter, Roland, if you have anything, feel free to say so. So pausing for a moment, getting a drink, and uh, waiting for questions from you. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I assume that you're all stunned in silence from uh, all these brilliant stories and ideas. So uh, assuming that that's true, I'm going to tell you one more uh, that should uh, give you some guidance for what to do once you find that big boss. How do you uh, shift their thinking? How do you understand better um, uh, and help them to understand better your position? One of the keys is you definitely want to ask a lot of questions. And that's counterintuitive because you might think, gosh, I'm going to get a short time with the big boss. Uh, I've got to be really convincing. I've really got to have all my arguments lined up. I better have some beautiful PowerPoint with dancing bears. All of that is not the case. It's much, much more helpful to ask questions, even if it's that 30 seconds in the lift, uh, and uh, to get a clear understanding of what's important to them, which is why I like this question that, that uh, somebody asked earlier. Um, really, really thoughtful. Uh, to, to ask, uh, you know, how do I make this important to them? How do I make sure I am working on the right thing? And asking questions and hearing their point of view and understanding their language is a way for you then to see whether, first of all, are you aligned? Is what you're doing actually going to be helpful? Uh, and, and then to put it in their language. That's what happened when I showed up to talk to those compliance people. If I'd showed up and just said, hey, I have an idea, you're not going to like it, but uh, we're just going to start uh, releasing new software every two weeks and we don't care whether we kill some patients. That, that probably wouldn't have gone very well. That isn't the language that compliance people speak, and that's not what they're interested in doing. That would have been very confrontational. Instead, I showed up and I said, you know, how's this work for you? We, we give you new software every six months. Uh, how's it work? And they showed me the, the, the big document and said, oh, my God, you know, it's very painful. It's, it's, it's challenging for us to keep track of everything. I said, would you be interested in something different? Because we're starting to do something different here. And that's how I got into the conversation that um, made, made, meant they were much more willing to, to go along and, uh, and talk to the regulator on our behalf and everything else. Um, and, and the other thing is uh, it's very important to have confidence. So um, it may be challenging to produce confidence. Uh, I often um, uh, tell people I'm coaching to uh, practice in the mirror. Uh, it's even better if you can find yourself a friendly eight-year-old uh, because the eight-year-old can ask you uh, to talk on a topic you don't know anything about confidently, and they love correcting adults. Uh, but even if you have to do it in the mirror or with a loved one or someone like that, someone who might be a little bit older than eight, um, uh, and anyone you can find to give you feedback, even yourself, is helpful. Uh, just practice talking on a, a randomly selected topic in an engaging, enthusiastic, energetic way. You know, uh, I think that dinosaurs uh, definitely had feathers. Uh, feathers are really wonderful for dinosaurs. And uh, the reason that they're great is not only are they helpful when you need to fly, but they're really beautiful and soft. And you can just go on like that, right? I just made up that one uh, off the cuff. That's the kind of thing an eight-year-old would be likely to ask you to talk about. And if you can do that with sufficient volume and confidence and enthusiasm, then you're going to be ready to talk to the big boss in that way in a brief period and to uh, lay out in their language, having asked them some questions, um, a course of action that might be different, moving some money, uh, changing the process, um, changing uh, the market or the approach. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a story about doing that. But first of all, we have a couple questions. Hallelujah. Let's see. Um, Peter says, how can we encourage senior people to spend more time thinking about the problems that people within their organization are experiencing? Um, if you have, uh, Peter, if you figure out a way to do that really reliably, um, let's go in business together. I would like to make a, a something you can slip in their coffee uh, that would cause that to happen. Because there's way too many senior people who would like to but don't know how. Uh, uh, others who um, really uh, either don't care or, or don't know how to care or don't have a way to get the information. So um, 
uh, I think that um, there, there's not a, a great way to encourage them to, in general, spend more time doing that. Uh, except maybe you know maybe uh, write a book that gets their attention and and helps them to to change their behavior or get them a coach. But in, in this situation where you're looking for them from below, where you're looking for the big boss, you're unlikely to be able to make that much of a difference. However, um, Peter, what I'd encourage you to do is think about how can uh, we talk about the problems that people in their organization are experiencing in a way that's important to them. Um, and Peter says, as opposed to an individual contributor having to seek them out. Boy, I wish I knew a way to make sure that um, you didn't have to go seek them out. Um, and and um, too many executives um, have a kind of bubble around them. Um, my co-author, Jeffrey Frederick, talks about the, the executive bubble. And uh, you can convince yourself so easily in a boardroom that you really understand the situation, that you know what's happening. Toyota makes their managers including quite senior managers, go and stand. They, they actually draw a little circle on the factory floor. And they say, managers have to stand here at least uh, 20 minutes a day or something. And they, they then have to watch the cars go by, watch the, the tires going in. They say, you know, it seems like there's an awful lot of running back and forth over there in the wing mirror department. There must be something going on in wing mirrors. It forces them to um, get that information. So, Peter, I, I don't know how to cure the overall ill of an organization or of, a, of an executive who is not listening enough. Um, and, and the only way I really know to, to, to get um, change going in a situation like that uh, is to go to them. So, uh, sorry, Peter, I wish I knew more about that. But if you know, <laughs> or if anybody else does, I would love suggestions. This would be a super thing to talk about um, on the forum. So uh, feel free, Peter, to, to come on over to the uh, Squirrel Squadron forum and uh, have a look there. Oh, uh, uh, somebody asks, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. I think it might be Mir, uh, asks, what's my plan for the recently fenced backyard? Uh, my neighbor grazes his goats in there. So uh, they, they clear out the underbrush. Really, all I want to do is make sure these people don't uh, go and camp in it. So uh, no, I'm not planning to do anything more with the, the place I've fenced. But what it is doing is helping me to make sure that, um, uh, that I find out uh, who owns it, if somebody does. Uh, or I can take it over. And in our case, where um, you know we're looking for the big boss, it may be you become the big boss. Maybe you're the person who actually organizes that new way of working or, or takes over the new sales territory or whatever it is. Um, that's not a bad outcome because you found out the boss was mythical. Um, okay, Peter says, enforced chalk circles will be deployed. Excellent. Peter, I'm not sure. I don't know where you are in your organization. If you're in a place where you can enforce that, I strongly recommend it. I certainly can't enforce it on my coaching clients, but I certainly tell my coaching clients to do this. Um, the fancy phrase for it, and I'm never good at yeah, pronouncing it, and, and I won't try to spell it for you, it's Gemchi Gunbutsu, um, and uh, that's Japanese for go and see. Seems like a lot of words for go and see, but I'm, I'm not uh, fluent <laughs> in any way in Japanese. Uh, but the, the concept, which goes back to Deming and the Toyota, um, the Toyota way and so on, um, the Toyota production uh, principles, I forget what you call them. Um, uh, uh, that that idea, that uh, that notion in Japanese of going and seeing it is fundamental to um, effective uh, management of a, a factory in their case, uh, uh, getting supply chains uh, to be minimal and uh, the, the factory to run as efficiently as possible. So um, I don't know if you're in a position, Peter, to enforce it, uh, but you certainly could, could in invite people to come to your standups. You could invite people to come along on sales calls. You could invite them to uh, participate in activities with you. Um, and you'd be surprised how often that works. I will say one, I, I thought of a story that I, I would, didn't intend to tell, but I, I thought of it because Peter inspired me. Um, way back at university, uh, I noticed that the um, uh, the president of the whole university, it wasn't a giant university, it wasn't like, uh, you know, one of the giant American um, uh, 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 behemoths, uh, you know, it's a whole city by itself. It's a pretty small university, but still, you know, there are enough of us and, uh, and, and not, uh, there's only one president. But he said, uh, you know, I'd really like to hear more from from uh, from students. And, and so I just <laughs> went up and knocked on his door. Nobody else had. Uh, nobody else took up this invitation he'd made in a speech somewhere. Uh, and I just said, uh, hey, wh why don't you come along and, and meet my dorm? I was a, a, a dorm parent. You know, I took care of a, a group of other students uh, in a, a dormitory. Uh, and uh, uh, darned if he didn't invite us to his beach house. <laughs> and we got to go hang out with the president and talk to him about issues that students had and so on. He had a great time doing that. But what he hadn't done was come around and knocked on our door. Uh, I guess this goes to your point, Peter. Um, uh, the uh, we, we did I did have to go knock on his door. 
I had to show the initiative. Um, but he was very willing. Uh, and so you might find that you don't have to enforce the chalk circles. You just have to draw them. There, there's an idea for you. OK, so I'm going to close with a, a fun story, um, uh, which illustrates how you can handle the big boss once you find them. So um, uh, I flew from uh, London to New York. And we were going to meet a, uh, a client. And uh, I, was, I had a salesperson who was going to come with me, a New York-based salesman. And um, there's a group of people who were coming on the next flight. I came on the flight one day before. And uh, these folks were coming on the, the next plane. And uh, unfortunately, there was then a giant snowstorm in London, which means we had like two inches of, of snow. And those of you in places where it actually snows often are laughing, but everything shut down. Heathrow was down, no planes were flying, nothing was happening, and no one could get anywhere. And so I was the only representative of my company, other than the salesperson, um, who was going to meet the CTO of Citigroup. And uh, uh, our company was tiny, tiny, um, uh, just a tiny startup. And Citigroup, of course, is world begirdling, right? It's um, probably hundreds of thousands of employees. I have no idea. Um, but uh, the, the, the CTO of the whole thing uh, was going to be deciding uh, on whether to buy our software or not. And the salesman uh, about had a panic attack because once he realized nobody else was turning up, they were all going to just be on the phone. He said, man, we're never going to close this sale. I mean, Squirrel, you're nice, but I was quite junior at that point. You know, I, it was my first CTO role. Um, I never sold anything like this. I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And he said, he's going to have all these technical questions and all these commercial questions and things. And Squirrel, you know, uh, I hope you can handle it. So I said, well, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm unlikely to, to um, uh, uh, be uh, burnt up by a fireball. Uh, uh, the worst is uh, it'll be embarrassing and we won't sell anything and, and we'll learn something. So I went along with the salesman who was wringing his hands and, and worrying. And uh, we, we got into the room uh, where a number of people were meeting. And I, uh, it was um, absolutely a scene out of a Hollywood movie. Um, if you've ever seen P President Putin sitting at one of his tables, he does this too, this giant boardroom table that was, um, it, it, it could have been 40 feet long. I mean, it looked like it was 200 feet long to me. I don't know. But it was a gigantic table um, and, and very narrow. So everybody had to sit along the edges. And of course, no one was sitting at the head of the table, uh, which was clearly where the CTO was going to turn up. So the salesman and I came in, we had some pleasantries. We talked a little bit about the software. These folks were all people internally who were already you know, had already picked up sides and knew whether they favored it or not, but the big guy was going to turn up. Well, eventually he turned up. Of course, he was late. That was a kind of power play, I think, by him, indicating that he was important enough that he could be late. And he sat down and his pen didn't work or it broke or something. I can't remember. And he started trying to write down a couple notes and he was frustrated with his pen while someone else was talking. Uh, and so I got up and I walked around the table. It took a while <laughs> to get up and walk all the way around the table to where he was sitting. And I brought him a pen and I went back and sat down silently. Um, and then uh, it was our turn to discuss a little bit. He got to begin talking and, and asking us from the company questions. And um, he started firing questions at me. He started asking things like, um, you know, we only deal with trillion dollar companies. And I said, well, we're not a trillion dollar company. Should we leave? He said, well, no, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more. So I'd called his bluff, right, and I was being confident. Um, and uh, I, I found out a few things that were important to him, and I could name a few technical tools that he had had success with. And because we were able to connect on a technological level using his language, and I was speaking confidently, um, we won him over pretty pretty quickly. He said, well, it seems like you're doing sensible things. You're, you're an awfully small company, um, but uh, I, I think we can give this a try. So you guys go work out the details. Uh, and then he got, got up, closed his notebook, and, and walked out of the room. Uh, then he came back in the room and from the other end of the table threw my pen back to me, which luckily I caught. Um, uh, and then uh, he smiled and walked out of the room. So, uh, you know, our total interaction was maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, it was mostly um, me figuring out what was important to him and giving him a, a, a way to see how what we wanted him to do by our product uh, would be helpful to him. And um, I was very confident. Uh, I just uh, figured I had nothing to lose and um, I might as well be um, firm in this interaction. And that really worked out well. Um, so uh, I do want to answer another question. We've got, uh, can I share best practices and uh, approaches to delivering the pitch? Well, that's what I just did. Fantastic. So I anticipated your question. I think your name is Mir. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong, um, but uh, I, I think I might have done that. And I hope that um, that story answered your question. Uh, folks, uh, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Uh, I liked your questions and I enjoyed having you here. 
Uh, I'm going to tell you where you can find out about the Squirrel Squadron, because I would love to see you at future events. Um, now, we're going to take a little break here uh, for Christmas. I'm going to go enjoy some time with my family and not have events. Uh, but the next one is in the week of the 8th. I guess that would make it uh, the 11th. Um, and that one, I believe, will be on hiring amazing technical people, um, even when you are not one. So what methods can you use for that? That's what I think it is. But um, have a look at squirrelsquadron.com. On there, you can find... Uh, oh, it's Jovan. Oh, okay. Hello, sir. Boy, that it doesn't come out that way on... Um, on my little list here, but, uh, and I hope I'm saying jo Jovan or jo Jovan, you know, I'm saying your name right, but I'm um, very glad that you had that good question. I, I like seeing your, your questions and comments on the forum. Anyway, come to the next event. That's uh, on the 11th. Um, uh, I would love to talk to you more about these topics. We have a whole bunch more coming. I send an email every week with lots more things that are coming up, and, and I'd love to see all of you on the forum discussing these things. Have a look there. I'm going to have the uh, Steve Jobs video there, which I, I think you'll enjoy. Um, I can't show you the video of the guy throwing the pen at me, but you'll you'll get the the sense of uh, how, it's, how it is to talk to folks like this um, from the Steve Jobs video. Okay. Oh, and Rich says, <laughs> Rich says he uh, loves the city stories and it's scary and he remembers it. Rich was on the phone. Rich was stuck in London. So uh, glad to have Rich here. Um, uh, somebody says, uh, oh, uh, final question here. Um, again, I'm not sure who this is. Uh, there are events that are exec only. That's right. Um, so uh, that's for um, to make sure people feel comfortable sharing more uh, of their um, their experience. Um, and some of the things are things uh, he, he'd like to get more. This person, he or she would like to get more information on, but can't because they're not an exec. Uh, you know, that's always a challenge. There is um, uh, a sort of exclusivity to some of the activities that I do in the Squirrel Squadron. It's because you get better conversations. If you have investors and recruiters and um, individual contributors in a discussion with executives, you don't get the executives being as open. So I'm really sorry about that. What we do do is um, include uh, summaries and comments um, uh, in a lot of my posts. Uh, so I often bring those things up. Um, we put up uh, transcriptions of uh, some of the events uh, so you can see some of the thoughts and ideas. And I would love your questions. So if you are interested in one of those topics and you, you aren't able to participate in it, but you have questions about it, uh, by only send them to me. My address is on uh, douglassquirrel.com. Heck, my, um, my telephone number is there. So um, uh, it, feel free to uh, uh, LinkedIn user. I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Um, fire those questions along, and I'll do my best to be helpful with them. Uh, I do need to have some of the events more exclusive simply so we have the right conversations. Um, and uh, maybe I should have some events that are not execs. That's a good idea. Um, Laura is here, so I'll ask her to remind me of that in the new year. Maybe we should have a non-exec event so where execs aren't allowed and we could just uh, talk about some of those issues. Um, keep getting more comments. I just want to get to these before I finish. Uh, um, Rich says, uh, um, act like their peer, regardless of how low you might be in the scheme of things. He says that's a McKinseyism. Uh, Rich survived 10 or more years at uh, McKinsey. So um, Rich has an awful lot of wisdom, and I learned a lot from him uh, with things like that. Uh, excellent. And the LinkedIn user, whoever it is, says that they're going to send their questions to me. I'm really glad about that. This is a fantastic community. I love working with all of you. Um, I like that you listen to my stories and tell me that they're helpful. I, I hope that they are. And uh, uh, have a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful new year. Uh, I will see you at future events in January. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody.